Good afternoon, everyone. If we could please take our seats. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late. Thanks for your patience, and thanks for coming back after lunch as well. My name is Natalie Drazen. I'm the North American Director and the UN Representative for the FIA Foundation. And I just want to thank you all for being here. And thank you especially to our panelists as well who've come from near and far to join us. At the FIA Foundation, we're fortunate to work with many leaders around the world. And many of them are you. And one in particular, of course, is IRAP. And I just want to take a moment to say how proud we are to be IRAP's principal funder and to congratulate IRAP on this great conference because so much work has gone into it. And I really think it shows how amazing it is that IRAP has grown in great ways. So can we just please take a moment to thank IRAP for everything they've done? <laughs> thank you. We're all here because we believe in the power of Vision Zero. But believing isn't enough. We have to see it. And before I turn it over to our panelists, I want to talk in a couple ways about how we can see Vision Zero happen. Now, of course, it requires policy change, and it requires fearless leadership. And that's what we're going to hear about this afternoon. I also want to talk about one way that we're working towards Vision Zero at the FIA Foundation, and to put in a plug for our Child Health Initiative Toolkit, which I think you'll find of interest. And there's some flyers outside. They look like this. I encourage you to grab one, because I really don't want to schlep all of them home. Um, and the point here is that Vision Zero is going to take time. It's going to take some interim targets and some interim wins to continue the momentum. And whether or not we succeed in Vision Zero is going to depend on demonstrating the power of the safe system approach on a small scale to scale it up. And it's also going to depend on enabling others to replicate that success. There's lots of ways to demonstrate the safe system approach on a small scale. And one way is to follow the data and to start with the least politically contentious, but also the most vulnerable population, which is our youth. Now, that's where Vision Zero for Youth was born. The focus is critical because road traffic crashes are the leading killer of adolescents around the world. And the idea behind Vision Zero for Youth, which is included in this toolkit, is very simple. Cities that don't have a target for youth but do have Vision Zero should include some targets and some achievable wins to get to zero fatalities among youth. And for cities that feel like Vision Zero might be too big to bite off, they can start with youth and then grow up the safe system approach on a demonstrable scale. Now, these interim targets and a smaller demonstration of the safe system approach make Vision Zero more palatable and more achievable, and they build momentum. We're doing Vision Zero for Youth in ITDP uh, in Mexico City with ITDP in a couple of key school areas where we've seen that it is politically resilient, it's surviving administration changes, and Bogota, which you heard from yesterday, is doing it throughout the city by, by working in 2,200 school zones. So there's different ways to do this. Now, Vision Zero for Youth is just one of the things in our toolkit, like I mentioned. And we created this toolkit because we believe that everybody should be able to ensure safe and healthy journeys to school. But every day, millions of kids go to school on dangerous roads, and toxic tailpipes are delivering emissions directly into their mouths. And every day, billions of kids go to school. So there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity because we look at what Rob presented yesterday, for example. Remember the map of DC, right, with the different green little spots on the map? If we look at that as schools, we'll see that eventually, if we have safe and healthy journeys to school, those spots will overlap, and the whole city will become safer. It's just a good example of how we can get there. And when we focus on that school journey, we affect as many people as possible, which is the goal of public health, of course. So there's plenty of resources about how to create safe and healthy journeys to school. And we want to make sure that everyone has access to them, to implementation guidance, to best practices, to data management, evaluation support, and case studies. And that's what you see in this toolkit. We made it together with plenty of our partners, like IRAP, EAST, AMEND, and many others, WRI, ITDP as well. Many of you in this room contributed, so I thank you. And we're looking forward to including even more. It's dynamic, it's online, so please do tell me if you see something that you think should be included. Now, policies that focus on youth are just one example of ways that we can all move towards Vision Zero. 
and I'm eager to hear of more examples today from our panelists. They're going to help us understand how we can effectively implement the policies that get us closer to Vision Zero. Inevitably, I will say, if you're making change and you're doing the right thing, someone's going to be upset, right? So I'm sure that our leaders today on stage will help us understand how to overcome that resistance and how to bring everyone on board to collaborate with the right people, collect the right data, and communicate the right information. I'll introduce each panelist before they speak. I had uh, prepared nice little bios for everyone, but I may cut them very short, even though it's difficult. And we'll be strict on time as well and take some questions at the end. First, we'll start with Mike Griffith, who's the director of the Office of Safety Technologies at the Federal Highway Administration, and Greg Cohen, who's the executive director of the Roadway Safety Foundation. Thank you, Natalie. I think Rob McInerney is pulling a trick on me. I was told I have 10 minutes. Oh, it just switched. It said six minutes and six seconds. So he's playing a trick on me. So in terms of picking up where Natalie left off, she did a, a nice overview to kind of set the stage here. She said, follow the data. And in the US, we have what are called strategic highway safety plans. Every state is required to develop their safety strategic plan to qualify for funding from the Federal Highway Administration for our Highway Safety Improvement Program. And this has been highly successful. This brings together all the partners to the table, and not just infrastructure partners, but partners that are on the education side, enforcement, EMS, and all the other areas, public of health issues, come together and say, OK, if this is what our data tells us in terms of where our problems are, the types of problems, what's our plan for getting there? And that's what these strategic highway safety plans do. We have a community of practice. We have resources that all the states tap into. We actually have every state's plan at this website. And we have resources for helping them develop their plans implement them and evaluate them. The states now have a new requirement. Uh, as part of our new transportation, actually it was in our last transportation bill, MAP 21, they have a requirement now to develop safety performance targets. And so they have to identify for fatalities and serious injuries what their targets are going to be in the future. And that all comes back to their strategic hobby safety plan. It's kind of their roadmap for how they're going to address meeting those targets. And this really makes the states accountable. And these targets are made public, so everyone's able to see what their targets are. And it has really kind of raised the bar in terms of awareness about what the states are doing with their safety programs. Whoops, I definitely hit the wrong button. Ah, oh, sure, Rob. <laughs> so. <clears throat> this is our database that you can go to and search. So if you want to know what states are going to focus on pedestrian bicycle safety, you can type in pedestrian bicycle safety and you'll see every state that has that as one of their strategies in their plan. If you're interested in knowing what states are going to focus on roadway departure, you can do the same thing. So it really gives you a national perspective of what the states are doing that's mapped out in these plans. Uh, we have uh, resources to help them update their plans. They have a requirement that once every five years, they come up with an updated plan. And we're right there side by side working with them so they're successful in, in putting together these really rock solid plans. Now with the time that I have left before I hand this over to Greg, I wanted to highlight some of the proven safety countermeasures that we're promoting in the United States right now on the highway infrastructure side. Uh, we're actually on our third generation of proven safety countermeasures. Uh, these countermeasures have to meet really two primary criteria. One, they're shown to be effective through research. We have evidence that we know if you implement these countermeasures, you're going to save lives and prevent serious injuries. The other criteria is they haven't really received wide scale use in the United States yet. And so when the Federal Highway Administration gets behind these countermeasures, the states listen carefully. They recognize that we've, we've spent a lot of time evaluating the different strategies, countermeasures that are out there, and that we narrow it down to a, so, a small subset 
that really are just at the early stages of development in this, or implementation in this country. And Federal Highway is going to give them a push so that we can get wider scale implementation. The ones that I show up here are on the screen are our new ones, version 3.0. But when I go through the other slides, you'll see the other ones um, that we had in our previous generations. So we have these broken out by different categories, intersections. Uh, I'll just highlight quickly the two new ones, systemic application of multiple low cost countermeasures at stop controlled intersections. Uh, actually, before I get to that, just to give you a sense of kind of where we are with some of these countermeasures, roundabouts we know have received wide scale implementation in Australia, Europe, and other parts of the world. In the United States, we estimate we only have about 4,000 roundabouts. Now, we've come a long way with roundabouts, but we have a much greater way to go. Because if you look at just a country like France, I think they estimate they have 30,000 roundabouts. And that's the size of one of the, you know, our bigger states in this country. That's why, with these, imp with these countermeasures, we're really trying to push them because they just haven't been receiving the attention they need in some of the locations throughout the country. So systemic applications of multiple low-cost countermeasures that stop controlled intersections and then reduced left turn control intersections are the two ones we're pushing right now on the intersection side. And I'll just mention with the reduced left turn conflict intersections, what we're doing there is we're moving the left turn turn movements away from the actual primary um, intersection and moving them downstream. So for example, making U-turns um, across the median. We know that we actually can get safety and operational benefits if you can remove this left turn, turn movements away from the intersection. That's how a lot of the crashes happen. Intersections are through these movements. On the roadway departure side, uh, you can see the different ones uh, that we implemented under the first couple rounds. Now we're focused on roadside design improvements at curves. Horizontal curves are a huge problem in the United States. About 25% of fatal crashes occur at horizontal curves. We know they're difficult to navigate. Uh, fortunately, we do have some different strategies that we can implement at horizontal curves. Uh, right here, we show a, a box here for safety edge, which is just a simple 30-degree uh, beveled edge that you put at the side of a shoulder where, where you have a drop-off. And you can see that the crash modification factors that, are, that, um, that exist through research. Uh, this just shows you some of the things you can do um, at curves with these roadside design improvements. We're all familiar with these, but there are so many horizontal curves in the United States that really could take benefit of these different countermeasures. Pedestrians and bicycles, uh, we're very active in this area. Unfortunately, in 2016, we had the most pedestrian fatalities in 20 years. Uh, the number of fatalities of people dying in, in the, uh, the vehicle occupants has gone down at a pretty good clip. But if you look at what's been happening with pedestrians and bicyclists in the United States, uh, the numbers have been going in the opposite direction. And so we realize we need to double down on what we're doing for pedestrians and bicyclists. And the new countermeasure that we're implementing or, or really focusing on are leading pedestrian intervals. This is a really simple strategy that you can use. You're simply giving the pedestrians a head start before the vehicles start making movements. So if you can give them that three to seven second head start before any vehicles are given a green indication, they get out there, they establish their presence, and it gives them a, a, a safer way to get started at the intersection. And the research shows a 60% reduction in pedestrian vehicle crashes. Uh, we have some cross-cutting strategies. So I, I started my presentation about the state strategic highway safety plans. Local road safety plans are something that we're really starting to see gain some momentum in the United States. Local agencies don't have the resources and capacities they do at the state level. But if they can just get started with a simple plan that kind of maps out some strategies and start getting some simple solutions in place, we can start addressing fatalities on all public roads and not just at the state level. I don't have much time to talk about US limits. There's been a lot of discussion here on speed. There's a lot of different ways to approach speed management. Uh, we actually 
had this tool developed by the Australians a number of years ago. They have OS limits, and we picked up from what they developed in Australia, but it's really an expert system that considers a number of factors in setting appropriate speed limits. It's really important that we look at all those different factors, such as what level of pedestrian and bicycle traffic do you have on a road, knowing that you've got vulnerable road users out there, and you need to take that into account when you set appropriate speed limits. Here are all of our um, resources we have on these proven countermeasures. I've got some uh, flyers that I'll put in the back of the room for you to take back and read at your leisure. And it looks like I've given Greg the perfect amount of time to take it from here. Sounds good. Oh, yours, Greg. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thanks, Natalie. Um, Mike talked a little bit about um, the state programs. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about county assessments and local road safety. Um, like every country I believe I've visited to talk about road safety, uh, we also have trouble um, with enough money for roads, enough money for road safety. And sometimes the lower level roads and the smaller governments uh, don't uh, access and, and, and don't have the way to make the case for road safety funding the way a state DOT would. Um, they have an added disadvantage in that, as Mike pointed out, state DOTs are really the source or the recipients of direct federal aid. So when it comes to local roads, tools such as USRAP and other safety tools are very important for counties to be able to make the case for, for road funding and, and particularly for road safety funding. Um, the, I'm going to speak a little bit about how our process works here. Um, Congress uh, sets funding formulas uh, according to different programs and distributes that money uh, to the state DOTs. Um, that covers about 90 to 95 percent of the total amount of federal aid given, uh, given out by the FHWA. Um, so nearly all the spending by state DOTs would naturally go on state operated and owned roads. Um, and generally, most of the programs that receive federal aid cannot um, use that money on local streets or on rural minor collectors. Um, so the highway safety program that Mike spoke about is different. It's, it's one of the only programs uh, here that can be used on all public roads. So this is a, we fund this at about $2.3 billion a year. It's um, been going up over time. Um, but it's still a relatively new program. It's only about 13 years old that there was a core dedicated program for highway safety. States are not required to spend that money on county roads or on, or on uh, roads uh, that are local, but they are required to use a data-driven process. Um, and that process, as Mike mentioned, all of those uh, state uh, planning processes are available on Federal Highway's website. Um, that process has to show how the state is planning to reduce uh, injuries and fatalities and vulnerable road user injuries and fatalities on all public roads. So while they're not required to spend on local roads, they have to do an assessment to show how what they are doing is benefiting on all public roads. So one of the tools that Roadway Safety Foundation through US RAP is doing to help the counties is to give them an additional data-driven safety planning tool to help show them how or make their case uh, for investments in road safety. And many counties uh, do not have the rigor of safety data that state DOTs typically have. So this tool is something um, we hope will ultimately be very helpful, particularly for counties that don't have a lot of crash data. As you can see here, um, it's a big problem because counties actually own about 44% of the roads uh, now, that doesn't mean they're covering 44% of the traffic, but physical lane mileage, they have about 44% of the roads, whereas states have about uh, 19%, and uh, other roads are about 36%. Um, so the FHWA does not require counties to do any kind of data-driven safety planning. That requirement is, is on the states, but they have been going out of their way and I believe voluntarily, not with any congressional direction to do so, to really make the case for local road safety plans. So uh, 
from counting it as a proven safety countermeasure and funding US RAP demonstrations as pilots to see how US RAP and other tools can be used by the counties. So US RAP has now been conducted on two pilots funded by um, Michael's office. Uh, one very rural county in Barron County, Wisconsin, that sounds exactly the way it is, very, very uh, rural and then a, a more urban and congested county, Palm Beach County, Florida. And um, we were expecting five additional uh, US RAP projects to be done in counties under a new uh, cooperative agreement that we expect to sign sometime soon, and that work would begin next year. Um, there's also two additional projects utilizing um, our new online training tools in which we're not funding, uh, one in Pima County, Arizona, so we're starting to see some uh, uh, self-funding projects and state-funded projects, and then the Chicago Metropolitan Planning Organization, which covers about five different counties, are all um, planning to do U.S. RAP in the coming year. And then one example of a state-funded, and some states are actually progressively helping their counties by funding county road safety uh, data-driven um, planning processes. In Utah, they're using U.S. RAP, so that's one that has been ongoing. Here in Barron County, we evaluated about 300 miles of road. As I said, it's very rural, 97%. 96% uh, of the roads are two-lane rural roads. Um, and 90, uh, and uh, the speeds were 89%, 55 miles per hour, or uh, 90 kilometers an hour um, uh, or higher. So very low traffic roads and um, very little data, obviously, when you have such low traffic to know where to do your road improvements. It's a perfect opportunity for US RAP to do an assessment. So we, okay, time's up. Let me, let me say real quick, um, here's some examples of, uh, pro of recommendations that we provided for Barron County. Um, in Palm Beach County, a much more urban area, more fatalities, more data, um, certainly more folks in the room to provide professional engineering assessments of our recommendations. And we came up with a number of outputs using US RAP uh, that we can make available to you. Um, and then finally, just quick lessons learned. Um, better results with continuous reviews from local experts. Um, and an importance to remind people what this is and what it isn't. It's not a substitution for engineering analysis. It's not a design guide. It is a planning tool to start the process. And as long as your engineers in the rooms understand that this is just to get them started, then I think you'd achieve better results. Um, finally, um, data review and quality assurance for coders is very critical. And um, again, uh, calibration is important, and this is a low-cost solution that um, particularly counties can afford. So I will hold off on the q and I I don't think we're going to do that right now. Uh, but thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Greg and Mike. And yes, we will have time for questions at the end, uh, as well as, as from those of you online. Uh, next, we have Ferry Smith, who is chairman of EuroRep. Well, thank you, uh, Natalie. Um, I hope you're not too much into an after-lunch dip, because my story about advocacy will not help you to keep awake. It's a rather a boring story, uh, but it's necessary. You need it to get, uh, to get your results. Uh, let me see, yeah. This is the reason why. And if you look at this graph, and maybe especially the developing uh, countries, they would say, well, you're doing quite nice, but we're not meeting the 2020 goals as we go on, like we do. And I was at the World Remembrance Day two weeks ago in Malta, and there were some testimonies of road victims. And then you immediately realize why you're doing this, and why it's so important that you work on, on, on this. The question is, um, if you look at these figures, uh, why are you so pessimistic about it? Because I am. And the reason is that we suffer from the success we had in the, next, in the, in the last uh, two, decade, two or three decades. And success is in our way. And we are looked upon 
and if you see the, the next figures, you see that we, uh, the, the Netherlands is the third from the, uh, from the left. You see we are quite performing well. We are under the European average in our performance. But if you look close, you see that we are not, well, not getting any better. Our innovation stays behind. And it has to do with the fact that everyone says, and I think in Sweden and the UK is more or less the same, oh, we do well, so there's no sense of urgency. And maybe a bit of a warning, if you start all your presentations with, as we did, we were very proud on the results we achieved. If you begin your presentation always with, look how well we do, then you, you, you're digging your own grave, so to say, because it's the success which, are not, is, stimula which is not stimulating uh, policymakers to take, come into action. And the um, um, World Remembrance Day, uh, the motto was, roads have stories. And those stories were no, not the most pleasant stories, I can tell you, because it was a story of suffering. And what we try to do in our European Road Assessment Program is read the story of the road before accidents happen. And I think with 20 years experience, we are quite good in it, because roads can tell us where the dangerous spots are, and we really should work on it. That's actually the reason why we stay on motivated. I will tell you something about um, the European policy framework. And, well, this is the result of uh, hard labor, but not so spectacular as uh, colorful pavements uh, uh, painted on the street, uh, trying to um, uh, change the behavior by, uh, of, of car drivers by, uh, uh, well, more or less guerrilla tactics to show that you can also use the public space for better things than cars. This is the result of many, many meetings in small rooms, in um, at the impossible moments, but it was necessary. This policy framework was proposed by Commissioner Bulch only in May of this year, and there are a couple of principles which we are very glad with. The safe system approach, the confirmation of vision zero, that's very important because that's our ambition, that's where we want to go altogether. Monitoring based on key performance indicators, not the most easiest thing to do, because we really have to work hard to get the right key performance indicators. Reinforce coordination between levels and sectors, funding support, and a global dimension. And all those principles led to, I would say, a very solid uh, strategic action plan on road safety. Actions as a part of the third mobility package, which was introduced in, uh, in Europe. And uh, there are a couple of things which I go later on in depth a bit. The proposed revision of the Infrastructure Safety Management Directive. The proposed revision of the general safety regulations for vehicles. A strategy on automated and connected mobility. Uh, we heard it a couple of times during the last couple of days that we have high expectations of technology. And I think we, we were right. But the reality of it is that we can't expect it tomorrow. It will take a couple of decades to be fully implemented. And it's not only automation, it's also cooperative automation. And that's important because traffic is communication. And if you don't have this cooperative part in automation, then you lose uh, a, a fi quite a little bit of um, uh, of the, the value of the system of, of uh, traffic. Concrete actions with timeline for current commission, mandate, and indication for action post-2019. And I think Commissioner Bulch did a very good job to secure road safety being uh, important after that she leaves office. Addressing all safe system areas from governance 
to vehicles, road use, etc. And there was a call for voluntary commitments, which we um, received very well. And she asked us the explicitly, please help us to uh, give some commitment. And what we did, together with FIA and ASEA, we were the first ones to uh, bring forward a um, road safety pledge in which we try to explain uh, ADES systems in cars to consumers because we think technology can uh, be uh, a very big contribution to road safety. More in depth, vehicle safety, new vehicle models should be equipped with advanced safety features and I pick one out, intelligent speed adaption. Uh, there was only the uh, day before yesterday a big debate in uh, Brussels. And actually, um, Matthew Baldwin, one of the members of the cabinet of uh, uh, Violetta Bulch, was very aggressive towards FIA and ASEA. Why we not more actively support this intelligent speed adaption? And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think we have to think rethink our attitude on, on that one. Maybe we should more actively contribute to, uh, to implement that. Infrastructure safety, help member states to syst systematically identify dangerous road sections and to be better target investment. Well, this is something where uh, Europe can play a role, of course. The anticipated effect we will save 10,500 lives and avoid approximately uh, 60,000 injuries in the period of 2020 to 2030. And it's very necessary. To give you an idea, in the Netherlands uh, last year, more people were killed on a bicycle than in a car. And from the 23,000 seriously injured, half of them is cyclists. And uh, we heard it a couple of times the last couple of days cycling and walking becomes more and more important in our cities. So we have to take action on that point. Well, there are key proposed measures um, on road infrastructure. Extend the scope, cover motorways and primary roads outside the 10T network, as well as uh, roads outside urban areas. Um, well, you can read what, uh, what it's all about and make it mandatory to take vulnerable road users systematically into account. There you go again with your bicycles and pedestrians. There are a couple of uh, opportunities uh, to reinforce uh, youth, uh, safety uh, measures from the European uh, and Europe perspective. We can benchmark. Europe is currently the only assessment system which is available uh, in the uh, United, uh, in, in Europe, um, at least Euro European-wide. There are uh, competitive systems, but they are more national and not um, international framed. The project proposal about SEF funding, um, there's more uh, uh, demonstrate to global safe system practice and network wide safety assessment um, and demonstrate high benefit cost ratios. This SEF funding we applied for uh, and we hope we get it in because then in the next two years we can really make a step forward as we did with the radar project uh, earlier in, in Europe. And last but not least, the report Roads That Cars Can Read is a very important one. We did it together with ASEA and um, ASEA and uh, IREP uh, delivered that report as a copy on your desk if, uh, if I'm uh, right informed. Please read it because that's uh, another step uh, in the direction of integrated automation. Just one last remark, and then I will quit. Um, what we did in the Netherlands was uh, something else. Uh, we founded this uh, Road Safety Coalition. And uh, Road Safety Coalition is very important because you have to work together to make uh, some results on road safety. We founded it four years ago. Now over 80 parties are together working on road safety. And there were a couple of times which I asked myself, is this a wise idea? Because if you do it alone, you go farther, uh, you go faster, 
but if you do it together, you come further. And remember that road safety is something about doing it together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. I particularly like that last comment, and I think it really applies to everything that we're doing. Um, our next speaker is Cody Towles. He's the director and senior transport advisor for the Millennium Challenge Corporation. I have to apologize that Cody has to leave at 3.15, just so you don't think it's something we said. Um, but Cody, I will turn it over to you. <laughs> I don't actually need that. Well, thank you guys very much for, uh, for being here. Um, so my name is Cody Tolls. I am the transport director, as Natalie mentioned, uh, at MCC. So my senior director was not able to make it, so he graciously asked me to do this because this has been something we've been pushing uh, together for I think the last five or six years um, and trying to implement this in our business model. So I'll briefly explain our model. Is there like a clicker? How do I? Because most people do not know who we are and what we do. So do I just hit the screen guy? All right. So Millennium Challenge Corporation, or MCC, was established in about 2004 by the US Congress. Um, and we're kind of an alternative development agency. And what I mean by alternative is our business model is not what you would expect uh, from a government agency. So our name is Millennium Challenge Corporation. The corporation kind of gives you an idea. We're set up to be more like the private sector to the, I'm sorry. Did I have a phone? I'm sorry. Yeah, my phone is. This is government. We have to have like eight phones for different things. Anyway, so we were established in 2004 by uh, the U.S. Congress. And to be the, uh, kind of a corporate type structure, an extent that you can in a government uh, system, which is very weird uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, so what we do is, um, well, we give large grants uh, to countries, to developing countries. They have to meet all their indicators. All this is online. Um, so you can't just, not just any country gets a grant. Um, and then once, we, once you're selected by our board, which is very much like a board of directors, once you're selected to go into a compact, we will start a, a due diligence phase or a compact development phase where we start to look at what are the constraints to economic growth. Um, and this is actually a very big part of our agency because uh, we're actually trying to uh, put infrastructure investments in and policies in place that will actually accelerate or at least contribute to economic growth. And we actually have a very rigorous department, uh, which a lot of people are... Uh, it's kind of a new thing in development, I should say, or for uh, our model is created this way in that we have a separate entity inside of our agency that does monitoring evaluation, but also the economics. So while I'm a transport director, I know how to do economics and transport. I'm not, I don't get involved in that, which is hard for me, but it, it is what it is. But there's a separate entity that does all this, and they also follow up on our investments, and all our investments are made public. So all this information about what we do afterwards, it's all publicized. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit, about some of the roads. And we try to use that, that, um, that learning approach, to kind of reflect on how we do our investments in the, in the future. So this is pretty much our investment portfolio. You see about 27% is more or less in uh, transport. So our typical grants are about 300 to $800 million. Um, one of the things about our business model is once the clock starts, we have five years, not one second more, to implement and spend that money. So there's a lot of work that goes up beforehand, usually about 12 to 16 months in the development phase, uh, to really get that investment going, and then we just have to go. And we work in very challenging environments. So you can imagine getting something done that fast uh, is quite fun, which keeps me up a lot. Um, so where do we work? This is, I think, our most recent map, it's about maybe six months old. Uh, so pretty much all over the place, a lot, a lot of West Africa. So that's pretty much where I spend a lot of my time, and now in Nepal as well, of all places, which for road safety, terrible. But we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So what have we been doing with IRAP? So we started off kind of slow with IRAP. I say slow as we didn't really know about it. So once we introduced into a few of our compacts, like the Philippines, Philippines number one, um, El Salvador Compact number one, uh, and Senegal towards the end. Uh, and we also put it into Moldova, and we, we also introduced it in Nepal, and there's another one that should be there in Cote d'Ivoire. And I'll talk about Nepal and Cote d'Ivoire a little bit more, as well as Senegal a little bit. Um, so you can see where we did the assessment. Um, again, we're kind of trying to figure out how, how to do this. 
So we did the Philippines in the pre and post, and uh, El Salvador in post-construction, post-construction again for Senegal. Um, and Nepal, we're actually actively doing it right now. I was actually looking for Greg. Uh, we got to sign a contract with him. Anyway, uh, and Maldo uh, Cote d'Ivoire, we're actually actively doing it too. And I'll explain more about that in just a little bit. Okay, so El Salvador, I apologize for the typo. Uh, it's right there, it hits me right in the face. Sorry about that. Uh, so, like I said, you can see the results. I, I really don't want to spend too much time on that, uh, just because I want to explain what we're doing now, which is a lot more interesting in a way. So, same thing with the Philippines. This was all done. Um, so, it's, it's actually been very beneficial for us. So, we're making all of this information public um, as the evaluations are completed. Uh, and we also did work in Moldova as well. Uh, so now what's interesting is I actually worked on this compact and we thought we were doing a really good job when we developed this compact and we put in, you're gonna make these roads to West African standards, UMOI standards, West African monetary and I can never remember the rest of it. Uh, so it's their local standard, geometric standards. We thought that's great, that's gonna really do it. And what we found out from working with IRAP and having an assessment done is even though we did that, and we actually went a little bit above that in terms of like crossings and you know, pedestrian access and all that stuff, we really didn't do so well in terms of the IRAP, the, the stars. Right? So that was a little bit of a shock. And so we, we asked Greg, well, why, why is that? What, what's, what's going on right there? And basically the, the, what we realized is the geometric standards that they apply in West Africa are a little bit too uh, antiquated. Uh, basically, we had a two by a one, or I guess two lanes in the U.S. state. So we had two lanes, and people were not respecting speed limits. So when we put this nice new road up there, forget 80 kilometers an hour. We're talking like 120, 180, as fast as the car could go before it falls apart. And what happens is you had a lot of head-on collisions. And so that's where our, and you, you'll see this to this day, the road before us, uh, before our investment on the north, that you'll see it constantly. They have a much higher traffic. Uh, than ours does, uh, there's constantly these collisions. So as a result of this, we now know that when we're doing these larger roads um, in the middle of uh, the countryside, uh, we have to really pay attention to how, to how to put divides in the side or also a lot of more administrative side, like how do we get people to understand to slow down and you know, keep the speed uh, under control, if you will. So that's been a very good learning kind of thing for us. Now, I didn't put a slide in here for Nepal because I want to be quick on time, and I know I'll talk forever about Nepal. Nepal, if you guys don't know, a lot, a lot of accidents. It's one of the most, probably the scariest place I've ever driven in my life. Uh, so we're spending a lot of time right there. We have a small compact, about 50, well, it's, it's a $700 million compact. We have a small roads component, only 55 million, which is very small for us. But we're spending a lot of time on road safety, uh, road safety uh, awareness. We're introducing, like, uh, what is it? What is, I'm, I'm blanking as I speak to you guys. Um, roughness on the, on the, Anyway, we're introducing new road safety techniques uh, for Nepal for road maintenance. Um, skid resistance, that's it, skid resistance. Um, and so we're actually actively, this is the, what I was trying to get Greg earlier today, is we're actually trying to do an assessment as we speak on the engineering design for a, a pilot stretch of road uh, so that we can improve uh, the road as, as we do our intervention. Um, now we're, uh, which is, a, this, next country is Cote d'Ivoire, and this is where it's a lot more interesting and challenging for us. This is probably our most challenging compact. We just signed this last year, November 7th of last year, um, and this is focused in Abidjan. So for those of you guys, for those of you who have not been to West Africa, uh, especially a capital city, it is highly densely populated, lots of people, lots of bikes, lots of you name it, it's out there. But we also have a lot of vehicles as well. So you can see we decided to choose the most populated trafficked roads. That was a great one. So, 85,000 vehicles a day. I see, and this is the large one. It's called, we call it the VGE. I can't say this French president's name. Apologize. Uh, so we have a lot of traffic here. The other one down south, uh, 27 to 40,000. Um, and then we get up to about 70,000 up on the north. And so one of the major challenges we have, especially on the VGE, and we've been working with IRAP on this one, is we have a lot of pedestrians. In some cases, we have pedestrians, over 100,000 pedestrians in just one intersection. So we have 11 of these things, and they're blocking traffic, flow, nothing's going through that pipe, as we say in traffic engineering. So we're trying to work, we've worked with IRAP, we've, we've identified the, I think we've done the assessment already, right? And one of the cool things we've done in Cote d'Ivoire as well is we're making this, we actually put this into our compact. So a compact is a treaty between two nations. So we basically are requiring that any road work that is done, it has to be done, has to have an IRAP assessment. 
um, which is kind of a new step for us. Like I said, this is a learning thing, so we're trying to uh, build this into our uh, approach. So, and actually, we're doing the engineering design. Uh, actually, we launched it, so any engineering firms here, please go look on our website. Uh, you're welcome to compete for it. Um, so we hope to have that done start maybe April or so. Um, and though there's an IRAP process in there where you have to, the final design that will be done has to in integrate all the previous IRAP findings from that. And one of the things we found out from IRAP while we were doing this is the road accident database in West Africa, or in Cote d'Ivoire, is close to zero. And the reason for that, they're coming out of civil war, so they just don't have good data. So we had to basically approximate more or less where things were. So as a result of this, we actually built a, an activity into the compact to help the local road safety agency, which is called OSER, to build a database out for road, to collect road safety in an Abidjan, and then they're also expanding it through the rest of Cote d'Ivoire. And one part I didn't mention on this is, this is the part that's the most interesting to me, is we're also introducing a graduate program, and it's a partner university program at the two local schools, the Grande Coles, if you will. And the idea is to bring either North American or basically international type expertise at the graduate level for engineering, economics, environmental, and social. And a lot of that is with road safety. Um, and the idea is to bring this kind of expertise, what we do with IRAP, what we do just anywhere um, into the local, how do you say, engineering curricula, but also in the economics curricula so people can understand it and work with it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cody. Next up, we have Bella Dinzar, who is a board member at the National Transportation Safety Board, appointed by President Obama. Thanks, Natalie. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I uh, have always um, admired the good work of IRAP, WRI, and IDB, uh, and um, in my past life, I uh, was garnering support for the decade of action or trying to get road safety targets into the sustainable development goals. So I had the opportunity to work with some of you in this room and with many of your organizations. So it's very gratifying uh, to be here now as we talk about how to achieve those targets through Vision Zero and through innovation. And uh, before I get started, just to let you know, these slides, the bad news is they're not specifically um, uh, related to each of the points I'm taking. The good news is, if you missed one, you'll probably come around again. So it's just background slides for your information. There should be about 10 seconds for each slide. <laughs> I thought I'd try something a little different this time. So today, I come to you in a different role. I come to you as a board member and a former, um, the previous vice chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, or the NTSB. We are an independent federal agency here in the United States, and we cover all modes of transportation. I was asked to speak today by Natalie about innovative initiatives, and I'll do almost anything that Natalie asked me to do, because I know it will be a worthwhile endeavor. And initially, I thought I would talk about drones, or our investigation of the fatal crashes involving autonomous vehicles, um, all you know, important technological issues that the NTSB works with. But after attending the Australasian uh, Road Safety Conference last month, I think that the very concept of an agency like the NTSB and how we're able to accomplish our mission to advance transportation safety is an innovation in and of itself uh, and that might be a useful model for your countries. So in the US, our road safety work is shared primarily by three federal agencies. The USDOT, you heard from Mike Griffith, uh, the CDC, which is our nation's public health agency, and my agency, which is the NTSB. As you can see from the photos, the NTSB is most often covered by the media. We're most known for our um, aviation disaster investigations or train derailments. But we never forget that the greatest number of deaths year in and year out is always on our roads. So that is a very important subject for us. So unlike the two other federal agencies, the NTSB is completely independent. We do not report to the Secretary of Transportation we do not report to the president. I like to say that we report directly to the public, uh, to the American people, and that is what makes us unique. Our Congress was quite wise at that time uh, in its desire to create an independent agency 
with a simple but noble goal, and that is to investigate transportation disasters and to make safety recommendations to prevent those disasters from happening again. And in addition to being an independent agency, we have five independent board members. You'll see a photo of us on the dais. We do not report to anyone either, and we also don't report to each other. So we're each nominated by the president for a certain term. So we stay in office even with different presidents. As Natalie mentioned, I was nominated by President Obama. And we must be confirmed by the US Senate. What makes our agency unique and effective? I think in addition to our independence, it's our agility and our ability to influence. Our agility or our ability to make recommendations based on a single representative case might be a useful model, especially for those countries still in the early stages of building your data collection and safety programs, as you're doing so well um, with some of the IRAP tools. And good data is very important, and it takes time to build these systems. At the NTSB, we rely on that good data, but we also conduct very thorough investigations and use those results from individual investigations to make safety recommendations with criteria for completion. So if you're talking about SDG language, you could say that the recommendations are targets and they have measurable indicators. So these recommendations have helped just in the area of road safety, not counting this is a uh, rail accident there. Uh, the recommendations have helped US states and territories make progress in road safety in areas in a wide range of air topics, from airbags to school bus design to safety barriers to safety legislation to standards, uh, standards for signage and many, many others. We are independent. We're agile. And most importantly, we are influential despite having no regulatory authority. That's right, we are able to accomplish our mission despite having no regulatory authority. That's because of our reputation. We are considered a trusted, reliable, credible, and recognizable authority in transportation safety. Perhaps it's because of our singular focus on safety. It probably also has to do with our well-known uniforms. Um, you can keep rolling those slides if you like for the next one. Uh, with the blue jackets, with the yellow NTSB emblazoned on the back. Perhaps it's also because of our family assistance uh, experts who provide information and assistance to the loved ones of those who've been affected by a disaster. We've issued over 14,000 safety recommendations to 2,500 recipients in our history, and 80% of those safety recommendations have been completed successfully without regulation. We have many success stories from infrastructure to education to policy and legislative changes, and many of them have been quite lasting. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, in 1967, a bridge collapsed collapsed in West Virginia during rush hour, killing 46 people. As a result of that investigation, which showed that among other things, the bridge had been poorly maintained, NTSB issued a safety recommendation that helped lead USDOT to develop the National Bridge Inspection Program, which still today requires that every state transportation department inspect bridges that are on public roads. In 1976, um, for example, in Iowa, a freight train struck an automobile that had slowed but didn't stop. And they didn't stop despite the fact that there were flashing signal lights at a railroad grade crossing. All five people in the car were killed. So after determining that the driver didn't stop before the railroad track and likely didn't know how to determine whether it was safe to cross the track, the NTSB recommended the national implementation of Operation Lifesaver, which is a great crossing educational program that is still in use today. And perhaps uh, for a more recent example, um, Natalie knows I love to speak about this. In 2013, we recommended that all states lower their illegal blood alcohol concentration, or BAC, per se levels from 0.08 to 0.05 or lower, a law that actually most of your countries, if not all of them, already have a sensible law that we do not have yet uh, widely in the US. And last year, despite well-funded opposition by anti-safety lobbyists, Utah became the first state to pass a 0.05 law. How did they do that? Well, 
they had well-established legislators and safety advocates in their state who called on NTSB for help. We testified before their state legislature. You'll see some of my testimony on the screen later. We wrote uh, op-eds in their newspapers, and we talked to media, providing a message that a .05 law would save 1,790 lives every year in our country, and that Utah could be the first state. And it was successful. And that is another unique aspect of the NTSB. We are allowed to testify and advocate for issues for which we've made safety recommendations. The concept of an NTSB is innovative because while many countries may have a transportation investigative board, many of them are not independent. And they may only cover aviation or perhaps only rail or maritime. It's important that with the NTSB, we recognize road safety as important by having an independent investigative study that also focuses on road safety. But I have to admit, at the NTSB, it is useful to have the media attention given to the other modes because it helps us advance our road safety recommendations. We use our easily recognizable jackets and logos. We use our good reputation of always being the good guys who come to help in times of disaster. We, do, we use our reputation for always doing what is right, even when it's not expected. So we fiercely protect that independence, our good name, and our credibility. Our rep reputation is really what enables us to be effective in advancing our safety recommendations. And likewise, the concept of Vision Zero allows us to imagine a better, safer, healthier world for everyone. And that is what NTSB safety recommendations also do. At the NTSB, we remember that targets must be feasible, measurable, and they must be based on sound science and investigation. They can also, however, be inspiring and ambitious. I used to say that our safety recommendations allow us to imagine what a world would be like if our work is as effective as it could be. But I think it's a little more accurate to say that our safety recommendations allow us to believe in a world where no one dies because a bridge wasn't properly maintained or because they didn't know that a train was coming. It allows us to believe in a world where no one even thinks of getting behind the wheel if they're impaired by drugs or alcohol. So our safety recommendations allow us to believe in Vision Zero and to make it happen. And I'd be happy to answer questions during the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bella, for helping us make it a reality here and also in your former role, of course, and still now helping us make it a reality all over the world. Uh, we next have Laura Ballesteros, who unfortunately could not be with us. Thank you so much, Cody. Have a good flight. <laughs> Uh, Laura couldn't be with us today, but she was kind enough to make a video. Uh, so she is the former Undersecretary of Mobility in Mexico City, uh, but holds a number of other roles. And if she doesn't point them out in her video, I'll be sure to point them out thereafter. So go for the video. Hello, everybody. I am Laura Ballesteros. Hello, everybody. I am Laura Ballesteros, and I am here with you by a virtual platform in this video because I couldn't be able to be with you in this occasion. I really appreciate the invitation of the IREP and of course the IDB and the WRI. Uh, right now in Mexico we are struggling with a lot of things so that's why I couldn't be able to be there with you but it is very important to share with you guys the experience of Mexico City in road safety and Vision Zero, of course, and especially the challenges that we will be facing because all this process it, it, it isn't over yet. So we just um, started the first, the very first steps. So baby steps in in, in, in some in some of that time. So uh, here you have the presentation, a very very short one, and I hope I really hope that in some other occasion we can just join and and, and, and meet in person. So, well, uh, first of all, uh, here it is important to see the big scale of Mexico City. Of course, we are a mega city with 9 million inhabitants living in the city, but because we are a metropolitan zone, we have uh, at least 23 million of inhabitants in the whole zone. And the 45% of the transit in the center of the city 
the most uh, uh, active because commerce or housing or jobs uh, receives the 45% of the, of, the, of the traffic congestion of the periphery. So we have to manage with that. Daily we have 35 million metropolitan trips in a whole metropolitan zone. So as you may see, the big, huge scale of Mexico City, it is important when you are not just trying to allocate budget, uh, of course, also when you are trying to start the planning and the design of a public policy. You can start working in 200 or 300 safe intersections in, in the whole city in one year. That seems a lot. But because of the huge scale of the city, no one is going to see it. And of course, the benefits, you have to be bolder and stronger than that because you know, you're not going to have large scale benefits just in that, in that specific point. That is okay and it is very important for the people who are living over there or traveling over there but the big scale matters. So we have 5.5 uh, million cars uh, also in our, in our streets with 1.5 1, 1. Um, persons per occupation per car. So this is also part of the problems of the traffic and congestion. And one of the most important things, and this is why it was such a huge challenge to implement the first steps of Vision Zero in Mexico City, it is that 23% of the budget of our city in, in, in infrastructure uh, matters, they are oriented into the car infrastructure, the great infrastructure. So as you may see, to invest in public transport systems in transit or in safer streets, it wasn't since five years ago a big matter for the government. That's why it was so important, the mobility law, and then on the road safety uh, strategy with the Vision Zero Plan. So how to transform our cities? This is a very important question because uh, Mexico City with this huge scale and all these challenges with the car-oriented infrastructure and budget, it wasn't easy for us to start the big changes. And each time we remember as a team, because this was a very collective effort, uh, where do we, where, where did we start it? Uh, it is amazing to remember that it was the team work and the collective power, uh, the one, the, the, the key words to start all the changes. And the first, the first step that we, that we started uh, six years ago, it was the legislative and the administrative changes, the politics. Uh, this is very boring for a lot of people, but it is important to take care of because you really need people supporting your initiatives as civil society or as private sector trying to make some changes. You really need people inside the government who can understand the, the, understand the, the next steps for, for, for the challenges of the city, but of course people who understand the mobility as a sustainable agenda. So for us, this was very important. Everybody started at that time to understand which role are we going to, to, to take care of. In my personal uh, uh, case, I was in charge of the new mobility law in the Congress. I was a Congresswoman in Mexico City Congress. And I started to work with a lot of people, uh, mainly civil society activists, to change the regulation in the city. So we started to change the new mobility law in Mexico City, and this was the very first step that, that, that of, of all the, the, the history of change and transformation and power to the people of the mobility agenda. So the very first step, it was you have to change and take a look for your uh, regulation and law frame. So this was the very first one. The second one, it was the planning instruments and the budget allocation. <laughs> Why it was important to change the law? Why it was important the mobility law? First of all, because we create a new framework for all the sustainable mobility agenda in the city, but mainly because we started with that specific law to mandate the government to allocate better the budget into the complete streets, into, into safer streets, into more um, and, 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 and better public transport infrastructure. So this was a specific goal 
So that, that is why it, it was so important also to then, once you have the law, then you have to start working with all the planning documents and, of course, the budget allocation. And the third step was implementing the new mobility culture. This was very important too, because you have to prove it. You have to prove that your regulation, that your planning documents, that the budget allocation that you are fighting for is going to be effective, efficient, but of course, safer and better in, in, a, in a sustainable manner on the streets with the people. So the first step is prove it. You have to prove your policy and you have to make it work on the streets. So when the mobility law was uh, uh, approved uh, uh, by, by the city congress then um, back on 2014, we uh, established the new mobility environment and for the vision zero strategy this was very important and I want to show you maybe if you can see this. The new mobility environment is a very familiar one for everybody here in this room, I'm sure of that. With the pedestrian at the top, then the cyclist and then the motorized vehicles. This is very important not just because we are accepting that we have a lot of different mobility systems in our city and not just the motorized vehicles such as the cars. Also because uh, it was the very first step to mandate the, the government to invest in these uh, specific uh, mobility actors on the street uh, and, and, and why? Because they were the most vulnerable users on the street. So this pyramid was so important at that time because it changed the way we were allocating the budget on the streets. So, you, did you remember when we started this conversation, I told you that the 73% of the budget was allocated for the gray infrastructure and the car infrastructure? Well, with this new pyramid, we changed that uh, percentage uh, and started to implement it the other way. The 73% for the people, for the bicycles, for the pedestrians, for the public transport users, and then on the motorized vehicles. So the changes started to, to change. The, 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 the streets started to change with this, with this very small step, because it was just a lot, but it was the beginning of a big change. We are not trying to um, create new categories of citizens. We, don't, uh, we are not trying to say that maybe some citizens are more important than other ones. That is not, it is not a battle be between the non-motorized vehicles and the motorized ones. It is just uh, the way to create a new comprehensive planning and designing street uh, work because we do care about the most vulnerable people on the streets. So that, was, that is why it was so important. Then also we changed the mobility ministry uh, for the CEMOVI. The CEMOVI is or now the pedestrian uh, ministry is very important because it used to be the transport and roads ministry that was bad not just because it was so uh, aged also because um, they were orienting again the, the budget in another different thing but nothing has to do then with, with the mobility sustainable mobility policy so we changed from the transport and roads ministry into the mobility ministry, and this was very important. We started to be the pedestrian ministry with this change, and it was huge because what we are trying to achieve with this specific movement, it was to create a specialized offices, public offices, to create a specialized public policies. So this is why it was so important to change our administrative behavior with new offices. This one, I mean, the pedestrian ministry, it was crazy for Mexico City, and it was one of our biggest uh, moments at that <coughs> time. Uh, of course, the other ministries, like the Environment Ministry, the Infrastructure, one, the Government, the Police, all of them were also part of this project <coughs> in a transversal way, because of course, in order to uh, get things done and to get results and, 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 and start um, creating this change on the vision zero agenda on the streets, we need the help of everybody, and of course we need their budget too. So this transversal job, it was one of the key points in order to achieve our results in the Vision Zero Agenda the last three years. 
Uh, we have two plan, uh, two plan, comprehensive plan instruments to implement the mobility law. For the first one it is the comprehensive mobility program with 70, uh, 27 goals and 239 actions. Uh, right now it is completed in a 65%. And of course, our most important star in all the public policy in Mexico City, the Comprehensive Road Safety Program, our Vision Zero Program, with uh, uh, 22 goals and 43 actions in order to get things done. And what is our main objective here? Zero deaths. With no excuses, zero deaths. Because that is the way to get things done. We have to accept that people right now are dying on the streets because we, as a government and also as a community, we are not taking care about the regulation, the infrastructure, the culture, the, the education, and of course, the public policy of the cities. So that is why the Vision C Regional it was so important in the mobility law. So this is the main point that I want to give you, how we change from the mobility law then the mobility ministry, and then with our comprehensive road safety program, our Vision Zero agenda. Our first, very first step in the Vision Zero agenda was to change the traffic regulation. And the traffic regulation it was so important, and it is so important because it is. The Sorry, that was me. But look, we can flip her all the way around. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I, I feel so sorry, car, uh, cutting Laura off. She is extremely impressive and helped establish uh, Vision Zero in Mexico City, as you heard, which reduced their fatalities by 18% and also helped us establish Vision Zero for youth there. Um, but just because of our time crunch, I'm going to keep on going, but I encourage you to reach out to Laura, uh, and she should be at TRB if any of you are there as well. Uh, so next up, we have Neil Peterson, who is the executive director of TRB, and also Bernardo Kleiner, who is the associate division director. And if you have not signed up yet for TRB, I encourage you to register. Uh, it's a great meeting and, and certainly well worth the trip. Neil. Thank you, Natalie. It's great to have a great marketer like Natalie start uh, for our presentation. So um, we're going to uh, tag team Bernard and I uh, about TRB. We want to tell you a little bit about TRB talk a little bit about the research that's going on, and then Bernardo will come up and talk uh, about some of the committees that we have on your way and uh, talk about the annual meeting itself. But you all have been very patient sitting here, so I want to start with um, having a little interaction. How many of you have attended the TRB annual meeting? So maybe about half, okay. How many of you have been on a TRB committee? Maybe about a third. Okay, how many of you have read a National Cooperative Highway Research Program report? Oh, that's pretty impressive. Okay, so um, I probably don't need to spend a lot of time with those of you who raised your hands about, about TRB, but there were enough of you who didn't that I'm just going to very quickly go through and talk about what we're all about to put things in context. We like to say we have three major functions, convening, research, uh, and advising. The TRB annual meeting, as Natalie said, is really something that all of you should experience. I would like to personally invite all of you to the meeting. It's January 13th to the 17th this year in Washington, D.C. Uh, we always hold it in Washington in January. This uh, year, 19, uh, uh, 2018, we had 13,700 attendees. We expect to break 14,000 this year. We have quite a few sessions on safety-related uh, uh, topics as well as other related topics uh, related to safety as well. We have 220 standing committees, sponsor conferences and workshops. We do uh, research in four areas, highways, transit, airport, and uh, behavioral traffic safety. I'm going, going to talk a, a little bit more about some of that uh, research. We uh, publish uh, over 900 articles uh, per year in uh, our journal, the Transportation Research Record. And we maintain a transportation bibliographic database that uh, has 1.4 million uh, entries and I think is the place to go to find information about traffic safety and other transportation-related issues. 
We're part of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine and do policy advice uh, as well. I'm going to talk about two of our uh, research programs. Uh, first, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, and second, the Beha Behavioral Traffic uh, Safety Research Program. The NCHRP program is funded by our State Departments of Transportation in the U.S. and is basically the research program for the State Departments uh, of Transportation. And uh, each year they set aside about $42 million per year for uh, us to administer uh, research projects. Generally, the research projects are in the range of half a million to uh, a, a million dollars uh, a piece. We have quite a few in the safety area uh, as well. I'm not going to go through and cover all of the titles here. I'll let you uh, look at the titles, both of some recently completed research as well as uh, re research that is uh, just gonna, getting underway. But we have research on local roads, which is a huge issue in the, in the U.S. with 54% with, uh, of uh, fatal crashes uh, being on uh, rural roads. And of those, 72% uh, are on roads uh, by local jurisdictions. We have, uh, we're looking at vulnerable road users and particularly pedestrian-related research. Um, a big issue in the U.S., I was the Governor's Highway Safety Representative for the state of Maryland. And it was always a struggle in terms of how would we make investments amongst the 40s, uh, amongst uh, engineering, education, enforcement, and, and emergency medical services. We're doing research in terms of ways of try, trying to um, make those investment decisions. Uh, uh, better data on severity, particularly trying to merge together information from uh, medical uh, information together with uh, police reported information. Uh, we're doing quite a bit of research to support the Highway Safety Manual, which Mike uh, Griffith, Griffith made reference to before, particularly in terms of new um, uh, crash modification factors. And we're more and more getting into safety-related research associated with uh, automated vehicles uh, as well. The second uh, research program that I want to uh, make reference to is one that we just uh, started uh, this past year uh, and we're doing it on behalf of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, and it's specifically on traffic uh, behavioral uh, research uh, issues. Uh, money comes from NHTSA. We work together in partnership with our Governor's Highway Safety Association uh, in terms of the research that's underway. And you can see we have uh, research on employer-based uh, programs, on effectiveness of messages on variable message signs, on legislation uh, related to distracted driving, particularly on electronic device use. And uh, we're starting to do more research using the uh, data from the second strategic highway research program, naturalistic uh, driving study data. So I've gone through that very quickly. I want to now ask Bernardo to come up and talk about uh, our standing technical committees and our upcoming annual meeting. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, everybody. Um, I appreciate Neil leaving me a few minutes just to wrap this up for you. I know I'm the tail end of this panel. Uh, to talk about what I wanted to get into, as Neil mentioned, was the standing committees at TRB, because he mentioned just a few of the research projects that are managed through TRB. We've heard over the last day and a half uh, about other research projects and other projects, and the question is, where does all this come from? It comes from getting people together to talk about what's going on and what needs to happen, both in practice and in research. So, oh, this is. so these are areas covered by TRB technical standing committees in the areas of safety. Um, so as Neil mentioned, we have over 220 committees in all, but these are just some of the areas from safety management, where we're talking about safe systems and, and zero, the data analysis, you know, this morning we had a big conversation about big data. Uh, how do we look at new data? How do we look at old data to answer new questions? Law enforcement issues and behavioral issues around occupant protection and, and alcohol and drugs. We know, we know some of what works, uh, but how do we know where to do it, how to do it better, when to do it, uh, in what context? Younger drivers, novice drivers, safe mobility for our aging populations, um, 
everything on the, on the infrastructure side of it. How do we know where to implement those countermeasures? What are, what are the countermeasures? We heard earlier about roundabouts. Um, they are used all over the world, uh, less than we would like in the United States. We have an entire committee on just roundabouts. The mix of modes on our roadways, from trucks, motorcycles, we've talked a lot about pedestrians and bicycles the last few days, but really everybody that's on the roadways, the footpaths, we've got committees that are talking about all of this. And the question you might have is, who, who are these committees? Well, Neil asked the question earlier, and you saw a lot of hands go up, and they're volunteers. They're, they're people like those in this room. So they're researchers and academics. They are public sector, they're private sector, and the idea is to get together and have the conversation. What do we know right now? What are, what's working? What don't we know? Um, so, oh, I pushed the wrong button. Okay. So with those topics, these are just some examples of meetings throughout the year that our committees organize and other conferences. The Highway Safety Performance Committee talks about not just the Highway Safety Manual that we mentioned, but again, looking at the performance of our roadways, how do we know what's safe and what's not? How do we measure it, and how do we know what to do with that? Uh, things like marijuana, uh, and not just the illegal drugs in the United States, but also implications of prescription and over-the-counter drugs that all lead to impairment. What are the issues around there? We have not fully understood all of those issues yet. Uh, as I mentioned, roundabouts. Every three years, we have a conference solely on roundabouts for two and a half days. It's amazing how much you can talk about roundabouts. Uh, they're not just a round street, and there are ways to do them, there are ways not to. There are places to put them, and there's places not to. Um, and a lot on pedestrian and safety. I mean, those are entire committees. There's so much, and we have subcommittees on these topics. How do we look at the crash analysis for pedestrian and bicycles? How do we collect that data? What, are the, what kind of signals work? What kind of countermeasures work um, in crosswalks? And, and there's a lot of cross-cutting. That's what we're also trying to do more of. The Roundabouts Conference, we have sessions on trucks and roundabouts and pedestrians and bicycles. How do, we, how do those interact? The highway safety performance, not just for the vehicles anymore, but how does that work for everybody else? Um, I'll skip forward. So Neil mentioned our annual meeting. Again, this is just a few examples of the kinds of sessions that if you join us in January, you'll see. So, Road safety research and practice. So again, we're not just research for research's sake. And research needs to be interpreted correctly to be put into practice. So there's sessions talking about that. Silos to safe systems. That's what we've been talking a lot about the last day and a half, and I think there's a lot of long way to go in terms of how do we not just deal with the law enforcement issues, but all of the issues. So again, you can see here, these are just, um, you know, we've, there's been a lot of talks about the scooters riding around DC. So in emerging forms of cycling, uh, you know, where are all of these issues going and what do we need to know? Um, I'll close with, you know, I only realized yesterday that the title of our session was Leadership and Policy. I'm not even sure if that's the exact title. Um, but anybody can be a leader. It's, you can lead a project, you can lead a pilot, you can lead a program, an organization, an initiative. But what it takes is to be informed. Uh, Natalie asked the question, about how, how do we get past resistance for policies. It's to be informed. It's in being informed with the evidence to demonstrate the issues, and it's being inv informed of the evidence to support the answers. So that's what we're trying to do at TRB, is bring all the stakeholders together to have those conversations, to share what's working, and, and really celebrate that, but also to be honest about what don't we know yet? Where can we do more research to inform where we go from here, to be able to do it better, to build that evidence base, and make sure that it's responding to the actual needs of those of you that are doing the great work. So with that, I'll leave it and hope to see you all in January. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernardo. That was the perfect note to end on. And thank you so much, Neil, as well. You know, when I look at our speakers and I look at those of you in the audience, it's so inspiring to see how we're moving from islands of leadership and policy success to really a sea of change. And that's how we're gonna get to zero. It's not just about being informed, which is so important. It's not just about the data-driven approach. 
It's also about reaching out to the non-traditional partners like Google. I'm so happy to see Google here in the room, and there's so many others that we have to bring along too to get to the sea of change. It's not about leading alone, it's about leading together. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I know that we are running late. I'm sorry, we did have a bit of a late lunch, but we will take just a couple of questions. Um, I'm not gonna ask any questions because I wanna hear from you. And we'll take um, just a few, and we'll have a shorter coffee break, just about 10 minutes, if that's okay. So please, ask some questions. Um, we probably have a couple online, and we'll take a couple at a time and then give everybody a chance to answer. Anyone? Oh, come on. I'm sure somebody in this room has a question. Rob. <laughs> uh, this one's for Bella. Um, the, when we look at the Jakarta bag, uh, airbag scandal and the, the implementation and the recommendations that, that came from that and then the, if you like, the industry response to that uh, was pretty all-encompassing from what we would see outside of the vehicle industry. When you relate it back to, to road infrastructure, I'm just wondering what your perspective is when you go... Basically, 30% of people worldwide have all died in runoff road crashes. Um, there could have been a recommendation 40 years ago to say we should make all of our roadsides safe, just like we make all of the balconies in buildings safe, or the, um, the Takata treatment was, was as it was. And I'm just wondering, when you, when you learn your lessons from the air and rail and maritime industry, what would really make a true scale change in road infrastructure safety worldwide? Thank you. <laughs> that darn Rob McInerney. <laughs> he always has to ask a hard question. No, that, it's actually a question that um, I've thought a lot about. I mean, not quite as eloquently put as you did, Rob, but, um, you know, in other uh, modes of transportation, I mean, at the NTSB, we were founded as an aviation investigative body initially. 90 years ago, and then gradually, in their wisdom, they added the other modes. Um, and if you see, uh, if you look at aviation, um, and I think now people are starting to look at aviation as uh, a model, there's a lot of information sharing that is not at all uh, competitive. So different airlines and different aircraft manufacturers like Boeing or Airbus will collaborate and they do not make um, the safety, they share safety information in a very discreet way um, so that they will not um, uh, have the same consequences. And I think the, it's difficult though for infrastructure, or just for road safety in general though, because for aviation, if there's an aircraft that goes down, people just stop flying in general. And so it, it affects everyone. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, for vehicles, people have a little, oh, if it's a Ford or if it's a certain, you know, Toyota, it's a certain brand. Um, and it's hard to, you know, and, and the road, it's even worse. You know, they're not going to stop driving on roads in a certain state or a certain type of road. Um, it was much easier with aviation because they knew that it would really affect their business immediately. So they had to do that. But... And I think one of your fellow Australians uh, mentioned this in the earlier coffee break. Sorry to take so much time, Natalie. Um, but, uh, you know, it's uh, the Takata, it was a, it was a story. Um, you know, there were people, people could see who were affected. I mean, we recently had a terrible aviation um, incident where a woman was killed um, when uh, there was engine failure. There was a fan blade broken, and um, unfortunately, you know, there's a loss of pressure, and she... And we recently had a hearing on that. Um, on, and I think it's, you know, there's a story. People, so they're going to do something about it. And in a way, that was what I was trying to, the message I was trying to give when I was at the Australasian Road Safety Conference is somehow we've got to figure out how to bring that story as well to, to infrastructure. And we've got, and I mean, NTSB uses that. We use those stories to get things done because for some reason, it's just more compelling. It's human nature, right? So, so think about that, Rob. Figure out how to do that. Yeah, <laughs> so, back at you. That's right. Okay. Mike. So I know the question wasn't for me, but so as you know, Bella's um, organization issues the recommendations, 
at the Department of Transportation. We're on the receiving end of our recommendations. We're still friends, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> we, we, actually have a very, we actually have a very good partnership with NTSB, but we've actually had a number of recommendations um, on how we design infrastructure issues for a number of decades. And as Bella was describing, they investigate uh, specific crashes. They tend to be very high profile crashes. And a number of those, actually, you gave the example of roadway departure. We've had a number of um, recommendations that have dealt with roadway departure issues. And so we have been, we have actually um, a number of recommendations on that topic right now. Now, you were, I think, asking the question more about all encompassing type recommendations. Um, if you look at all the recommendations we got on just that particular topic, it covers a wide scope in terms of dealing with that problem. So there are a number of recommendations that are happening on the roadway infrastructure side um, that we're involved in responding to NTSB on. Natalie, yeah. but just very briefly, uh, I was both State Highway Administrator and Governor's Highway Safety Representative in Maryland, and there are not enough resources to bring every roadway up to what we would want to be desirable standards. It really has to be viewed as being a risk management approach. You go in and you try to address where you have the greatest risks, greatest, greatest exposure, uh, and uh, take that type of approach. And it's not always going to be an infrastructure solution. Uh, one of the big, as I said, one of the biggest struggles I had was how do you balance what the investments are that you make between the engineering, the education, the enforcement, and emergency medical services? Thank you. Uh, Maricela, I think we have one online. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. We do have a, an online question. So there's a question regarding uh, why in the USA, regarding all the information being done, why the, 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 um, the deaths haven't gone down dramatically, and what has been, what are the approaches uh, being done in order to improve um, um, public transportation in the U.S.? Because there's a lot of people that that believe, right, that the U.S. has very much being driven by just uh, um, private vehicles, or and public transportation, it hasn't been really developed for, for a lot of communities. So those are two questions. What is there still to be done in order to, to get the numbers down in the US and what has been done on public transportation? Thanks. Those are excellent questions. Government, anyone? <laughs> Go ahead. I'll start with yeah? the first one based on, <laughs> there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of uh, questions as to why uh, we've actually seen the number of fatalities go up in the last few years. Uh, it happened to coincide with our coming out of the recession, there being more travel, uh, more people actually being employed and therefore traveling uh, more to, to uh, work as well. But it also coincided with a lot more use of uh, electronic devices and other distracted uh, driving uh, that was taking place. Uh, so uh, Fortunately, the last year or so, the numbers have started to come back down again, but uh, at least in terms of the research that's been, that we've seen so far, I think it's uh, largely been attributed to those two factors. I I'll let someone else handle the second question. Yeah, well, just maybe to build off that, I think what's been interesting in the United States is that, yes, we've had an increase in fatalities recently, which is obviously very tragic. We had uh, th over 37,000 people lose their lives uh, in 2017. Uh, the good news is actually in 2017 we saw a slight decline compared to 2016. If you look at over, a, say, a 10-year period, we've actually had a reduction in fatalities of occupants and vehicles. As you know, we have safer vehicles now. There's been a lot of progress made there. A lot of technologies have come on board. Where we've seen the increases is with the vulnerable road users, motorcyclists, pedestrians, bicyclists, scooter users. We have all different personal conveyances of technologies people are using today. And we don't have a good handle on exposure for all those different vulnerable road users. And that's something we're working on. We're trying to have a national methodology so we can measure exposure. That's really important. You need to know how many people are taking these different forms of transportation and where to help start using the different solutions we have. We're not going to obviously wait 
until we have national exposure numbers for all these different user types. But I think we're starting to, not just the national level, we're starting to see at the state and local level that if we're going to be successful in driving down fatalities, we've got to start addressing the vulnerable road users at a, at a much higher level than we are today. Greg? Uh, and I, and just to add to, to that point, uh, I think because there's been such a, um, an increase in new um, modes, uh, uh, the scooter is one that just really jumps to mind. I don't, you know, I think that, that we're, we've been experiencing a sudden change in vulnerable road users, including new modes in these last few years that um, I think the initial reaction, there's, there's, there's a conflict here because we're encouraging and, and we're, I believe, I can't remember who the speaker was, but there was an event that I was at where um, it was a safety conference actually, where the, the, per, the, the, the speaker said that the perception was more important than the reality in terms of the safety, and that we needed to um, increase the number of folks out there um, to, make, uh, to make them more safe, but there was no data there. Um, so. So while we want to encourage sustainable mobility, I think we also need to look at um, rules of the road even for some of these forms of transportation. We have a lot of lane splitting. I know that's true worldwide for motorcyclists. We have um, uh, very unregulated uh, um, behaviors um, and almost all the attention has been on uh, the drivers. So it's a combination of things. We got to work in education and engineering for both the drivers and the vulnerable users themselves. I'll try to take a crack at the second question. Because um, we, we actually have been trying to do some research on the issue of why public transportation usage has been going down over the last five years. And there's not definitive conclusions right now on it. But uh, the hypotheses that we're really trying to test in the research that is going on is, first of all, with the booming economy, there are a lot fewer, fewer people who are transit dependent now. The first thing they do when they get enough money uh, as a result of going off unemployment is to buy a car and, and to be driving. Uh, there has been some competition with, for example, the transportation network companies like Uber uh, and Lyft. But, that hasn't had as big an impact as uh, some have speculated. Um, and um, it's, it's just people um, value their time such that they want to be using whatever mode ends up being that, that which is most convenient for what they want to be doing. So those are the hypotheses that are being tested at least right now in terms of trying to understand why public transportation usage is going down. Bella. If I might, very briefly. This is a very timely question because right now, one of my colleagues, uh, who's the current chairman, Robert Sumwalt, is over at the American Public Transportation Association at their big meeting talking about this. And I think that there, you know, Neil brought up a point. There isn't enough money, but that's not really the issue. The issue is that there's not a willingness to give enough money. There is enough money out there. It's, but it's true, Maryland didn't have enough money for infrastructure. We're not giving enough money for public transportation. But it's all about what our willingness, what our priorities are. I'll give you my um, agency as an example. I mean, I, you know, I talk about how great we are, but we're certainly not perfect, far from it. Because we have 425 people, and half of them are devoted to aviation. But if we were really devoting the number of staff to the number of people, we would have three times, five times, a hundred times that many that we have devoted to road safety right now. So, I mean, what is that way that we can change so that road safety is looked at as important as aviation? I think your countries, if you haven't done it already, you can avoid the big mistakes we're making, and you can make road safety more of an issue uh, than the others. It's not as glamorous as aviation. It's not as glamorous as having a big train wreck that I have to go to, but, uh, but you could save so many more lives. Thank you. Uh, I agree. I think there needs to be more resources, and we need more leadership. We have a lot of that leadership here in this room, which is why this is so important. 
But we need to scale that up. The US has started to move towards a safe system approach through Road to Zero, for example, but that needs to continue and we need to build momentum. And we still need to talk a lot about the safe system approach in this country. Uh, as far as the sustainable mobility part, we have a love affair with our cars and that needs to end. Uh, and there's a lot of, of ways that can end and resources is certainly one of those ways. So I will thank all of our panelists again for being here and for bearing with us as we started a little bit late, apologies. And I will let you all go to your coffee break, but please, please do come back uh, at four. It, okay, yes, at four. Um, <laughs> for our next panel because we don't want to have you go home late. So quick coffee break and please come back at four. Thank you so much.